Hi everyone, we are going to get started shortly. Um, I have a guest who is joining in with us tonight. So as soon as that, uh, oh, she's on. So as soon as she sends me the request, we will begin. And don't mind me, I'm just closing my child's doors as they have music coming from their rooms. All right. So I'm gonna wait. And it should connect. Okay. Okay. Well, Hi, how are you I'm, doing? I'm wonderful. I'm trying to figure out how to, there it is. I guess I'm in your, in your view now, right? Yep, I can see you. All yep. right. Good evening. God bless you. I love you. Thank you. God bless you too. Good evening. How You're doing okay? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and just kind of introduce um, what we're talking about tonight so people know who are tuning in. Okay. And then I'll... Um, have you tell us a little bit about yourself and then we can jump into your questions. Okay. Um, so hi everyone who's tuning in. Um, I'm Cecily Ganhart. I um, am a maternal fetal medicine physician uh, who has an interest in obesity medicine. As always, I have our lovely medical disclaimer that None of this constitutes as personal medical advice since I don't know your history and I don't have access to your medical records. Um, so this week, what we're going to do is um, switch it up a little bit. And I have a guest on tonight who also follows the webpage and the Instagram account. And we're going to be going through a few questions and answers. And then if we have any time at the end, we'll take some of your um, viewer questions. If not, if we don't get to questions that were submitted during tonight, I'll review them and then I'll post the answers over the week to the Instagram. So, all right, with that, uh, Francis, would you like to begin and introduce yourself? Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, I'm in California, so we're a little bit different timing. Um, God bless you. I love you. I am Madonna Minister, uh, Reverend Francis, 31 Days Mills. I'm a metaphysical practitioner and believe in healing through uh, Bible and biblical med you know, uh, meditation. And I'm really interested in learning about intermittent fasting. Uh, we've talked about fasting and prayer being one of the methodologies for healing. So I'm just excited about meeting uh, you, doctor, and learning more about intermittent fasting. Great. Thank you. So um, what we can do then, we can begin um, and discuss some of the questions that you had. I began uh, reading and watching the um, book that you recommended, and one of the things that stood out to me that I thought I could use a little bit more understanding about would be the um, hypothalamus, mm -hmm. right? okay, um, how it works and how it is used for, you know, how it affects our fasting and health. Okay. No, that's an excellent question. And you're right, because I think once you start diving into fasting more, there is a lot of science behind it. And so some of the systems yeah. that they'll talk about are the endocrine system or the hypothalamus, or also a lot of people may have heard of the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary, um, adrenal axis, where people talk about fight or flight responses and things like that. So um, just to give kind of like a high level overview, so we have the hypothalamus, and I did make um, a diagram. I'm going to see if I could switch my camera on here. It's not an all-encompassing diagram of all the organ systems, but it will probably help make the uh, question answer a little um, easier. So we have the hypothalamus, and if we think of the hypothalamus here kind of as the control center, or the command center, um, for and it basically receives peripheral uh, signals from the body, also from the brain, and it integrates them. And it's kind of like 
the boss is how I think of it. It regulates our endocrine functions by providing secondary signals to other systems. So for instance, underneath you'll see the pituitary and the pituitary is kind of how I describe as um, the project manager. So you have the boss, but then you have the project manager who gets feedback from the boss and then kind of directs all of the people um, who were on that team. And that's kind of the easiest way I can think of to explain it. So for instance, um, we hear about the thyroid, which is down here, um, an organ that receives signals from the pituitary, but in order for the uh, pituitary to signal the thyroid to either make more thyroid hormone or less thyroid hormone, that is getting that feedback from the hypothalamus. So really the hypothalamus serves as a coordinator between the brain and then also receiving um, peripheral feedback, whether that be from our gut, right? Whether that be from stress um, hormones, um, and it kind of help up regulates or down regulates the functions and, and hormones that are being sent from the pituitary. Okay. Um, that I think would take a little bit more study on my part. I, and I'm, I'm kind of understanding what you're saying. Okay. Then explain then how will fasting uh, interact with that system of the uh, hypothalamus gland, gland right. and the pituitary gland. Right. So for instance, with fasting, what we think happens is that it increases um, insulin sensitivity. And so insulin um, being either high or chronically uh, elevated and the fact where your tissues are no longer responding to it makes some of these secondary processes down here think that they have inadequate amounts. So the example I'll give is um, for thyroid disorder, for instance, hypothyroidism, meaning that you're not making enough thyroid hormone. So if that is happening, we'll notice that whether this is chicken or the egg, but weight gain is a com common symptom or a, a feature that you'll see in people with hypothyroidism. So if the oh, one thought, school of thought, is that if you are suffering from obesity, you may be making enough thyroid hormone, but your body senses a relative hormonal deficiency, which then in turn has your pituitary secrete more of a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone, which is trying to get the body to make more thyroid hormone. So how fasting could come and interplay in that is if you're able to increase your insulin sensitivity and you're able to then start to reduce your weight, then your tissues aren't necessarily as resistant it may not sense that overall um, deficiency in thyroid hormone, and then in turn could provide feedback signals all the way up through the hypothalamus saying, okay, wait now, we have enough thyroid hormone, which then you would see in turn potentially lower your um, pituitary TSH since that's signaling you have enough thyroid hormone. And that's just one possible potential mechanism. But basically, if we believe that a, um, a lot of diseases today, their central cause has to do with insulin resistance and with insulin providing um, altered feedback loop into this HPA axis than what it's supposed to do. If you can use intermittent fasting to improve your insulin sensitivity, which then in turn should make it easier for you to lose weight, then that helps all of these feedback mechanisms that may have been out of whack. So for instance, there's a condition called metabolic syndrome. And at the core of metabolic syndrome is insulin resistance, which then can cause high blood pressure or it can cause diabetes. Um, it causes people to carry excess fat around their midsection, um, causes problems with your triglycerides and with your, um, you know, LDL and HDL. So for instance, if you the theory is anyway, if you perform intermittent fasting and you're able to lose that weight, you improve your insulin sensitivity. And so some of these downstream diseases 
then start to resolve themselves because you've taken away or improved the root cause of some of those dysfunctions. I see. Okay. Okay. So, and there's still more study being done about some of this and they're, uh, you know, looking at different animal models and things like that to try to put some of these concepts into play. But um, we do know that weight loss improves some things like metabolic syndrome, um, non-alcoholic, uh, fatty liver disease. And when you start at hypertension, diabetes, and so when you start looking at what the core uh, commonality that a lot of these processes have, it's insulin resistance. So, Okay. I kind of also kind of thought when I was reading up on it that it also had something to do with setting, like your body knows what weight you know, it has, and it, and it kind of like sets the weight for you or? Uh, right. So some people talk about the body set weight um, in terms of if you um, are at a certain weight you, for a long time, your body resets, the signals to the hypothalamus reset and believe that this is supposed to be your new norm. So if you start to um, lose weight and which classically is like the, you know, eat less, move more, where you're calorie restricting, then over time what happens is your body lowers the metabolism and some of these peripheral signals so that it bounces you back up slowly towards weight gain. That's what that theory is kind of talking about. Or for instance, if you gain weight, if you have your set point, then hopefully counter mechanisms come into play that help you decrease that set weight. And so, um, I think they're still doing more research on that, but that's some of the premise of the obesity code when they mention the body set weight and how intermittent fasting can help to set a new or create a new body set weight at a lower weight, at a lower weight so that you can gradually lower um, your body weight. That's kind of what that concept is about. I under, I, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying. Now, the other question that I had was referring to the carbohydrates, mm -hmm. refined carbohydrates versus regular carbohydrates. Right. And so this is an area, it's, it's really interesting because I think, and I mean, I've done it too, and I still do it sometimes. We classify things as either good carbs or bad carbs. Um, but it's a little more complex than that. So you have simple, if we're just at the basic level, you have simple carbohydrates and you have complex carbohydrates. So just because something is a complex carbohydrate doesn't mean it's good per se. And just because something is a simple carbohydrate doesn't necessarily mean it's bad per se. So all the simple carbohydrate mean only has either sugar molecules bound together and its chemical structure. And then a complex carb should have three or more molecules. But within that, you can have uh, things like, so technically a potato, like a white potato is a complex carbohydrate. But we know if you give a diabetic a bowl full of mashed potatoes, their post-meal blood sugar is going to skyrocket, right? So even though that's a complex carb, potatoes, white potatoes in particular, are going to be something that a diabetic should stay away from because of its effect on blood sugar. So then what I think people are referring to more when we talk about, you know, good carbs versus bad carbs are the refined carbohydrates. And so what a refined carbohydrate is, is typically a carbohydrate that's been processed. It's either been stripped of that outer covering, um, you know, uh, for instance, like whole grain wheat versus white bread, right? The whole grain wheat still has the husk and all of that into the grounding process of the flour when, uh, versus with white bread that has been removed. And so with refined carbohydrates, the thought is that when you eat those, those will um, more rapidly be available in your bloodstream as glucose. And if we believe the theory that insulin resistance plays a role in obesity and disease, you don't want to constantly eat foods on a regular basis that spike your um, 
blood sugar, you know, up and down, up and down, because that causes multiple insulin responses. Um, I think potentially a better way to look at the carbohydrates is to do um, more of whether it's a glycemic load or, um, or the glycemic index. So, and people debate about this, and that's that's the problem with a lot of nutritional sciences. We all are debating, right? Or, you know, we're still finding out what the perfect thing is. Um, so what I, um, there, the two things that we can go over, so you have the glycemic index. And again, that's just a basic um, amount of how you, uh, how your blood sugar responds after eating a certain uh, meal. And then you have your glycemic load, which tries to incorporate both the quantity of carbohydrate that you're using versus, uh, and also the, the uh, quality of the carbohydrate. So trying to get at more with the glycemic load, load, excuse me, kind of that good card, bad card thing. Um, but no matter which chart you use, the lower the glycemic index in general and the lower the uh, glycemic load is, the less response you would expect it to have on your blood sugar. Now, there are going to be exceptions to the rule of that. But when you're quantifying carbs, it's also helpful to look at that. Now, an easy thing to kind of do because all of that can be like, well, do I have to look up a glycemic index every time I eat something or a glycemic load? And and no, you don't have to do that. Typically, if you're eating whole real foods, um, those are going to be better for you than processed foods or high starchy foods. You know, and I guess what I'm saying, Dr. Shipley, after thinking of those two items, Mm -hmm. I kind of move towards the ancestral eating mm -hmm. um, because I think that as um, a person that's my age, you know, we I've been kind of way without knowing. Well, I guess I'm thinking, well, I, I'm eating a balanced diet, mm -hmm. but um, the ancestral way that I eat is the way that my mom prepared her food in the way that my grandmom prepared her food. And so now I'm finding myself in this, we're talking about a whole nother way of eating and understanding. If I cook black eyed peas, which I'm thinking I'm doing a, a healthy thing, but then of course I'm gonna cook the rice, mm -hmm. with the rice and black eyed peas. So I guess I'm, then that brings all of what you're saying back down to how does that affect our ancestral uh, way of eating. Right. And it's interesting because, I mean, there's classically um, some populations that eat rice as a staple in their meals and are not necessarily obese. So I don't necessarily right. think that it's just that one food. But what I find is that, you know, like I got a question the other day was that, you know, I think a lot of my weight gain is related just to the bread that I eat. And, and, you know, it may be, but I often find it's just not one food. Does that make sense? It's not just yeah. one food. It's kind of the meal timing also that goes into play with it. And what else are you eating that goes with that? So for instance, if you have black <laughs> eyed peas, black, what, no, but if you have black eyed peas and rice, I mean, you know, that probably isn't necessarily <laughs> something that you eat every day, right? You may yeah. eat it on occasion, um, which when you eat your black eyed peas with, with your rice, that is fine because you're probably not eating it every day. Or if that's what you're eating, maybe you're not eating lots of other refined carbohydrates, right? And I think it's like the total or the, the load on you because you're right. There's lots of people who eat more ancestral ways and the food is coming from a natural source and we see that they don't have problems with it. Um, the biggest con com the contrast or comparison I see, there's recently an uh, article that came out saying that the Mediterranean diet, which is more of a plant-based diet, some meat 
but mainly plants. And then when you are eating meat um, and healthy fats, the he healthy fat is mainly uh, virgin olive oil. And then the um, oh meats are going to be more of your fish or your poultry. And then they eat very little red meat. So they have a very healthy you know, long life expectancy. Then contrast it to, there's been a lot of research done on the Maasai tribe um, and their diet is mainly meat, blood, and milk. And they also experience very low rates of disease or illness. So I think what the common core is that you're obviously, um, I mean, we all respond to different things to, uh, in various manners because of our genetic background and makeup. But um, if you are getting at whole real foods, and that's when um, when they're talking about ancestral diets, if you're eating whole real foods, you don't necessarily run into some of these other disease problems. Um, but, but I do think sometimes a common mistake people make is they just eliminate one portion of their diet. So for instance, like the rice, they may eliminate all the rice, but they're still having, forgetting about that midday snack that they have every day, or the couple of pieces of candy that they have, you know, at their desk or the diet pop that they're drinking on a regular basis, even though it says, you know, sugar free or diet, you know, calorie free. And, and it all kind of goes together. So I don't necessarily think that unless you think you're eating globs of rice do you know what i mean all the time that mm -hmm. having rice on occasion is a bad thing i just think it's all about moderation and and what else are you eating and then the combination of the meal timing when you are eating i see well just getting started i've um more or less began from the eating between the 10 and 4 hours mm -hmm. of for the last week and I'm finding that that's doable. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, okay. Yeah, so no, that. That's that's what my um, I have a great aunt who's 102 and who lives by herself and fully functional and has a memory sharp as a tack and probably less yeah. health conditions than many of us. But um, she, that's what she does. She's done that for a while eating at 10 and four. And then she is, um, like I said, more plant-based where she can go, you know, a couple weeks without having meat in her diet. Um, but she does eat meat. It's just, she doesn't necessarily crave it at every meal. Um, and she, I mean, her health, her health is great. So that's the thing. I, I think there's lots of different ways to go find health but it's interesting that when we look at some of the societies that are healthiest um, many of them do have kind of a natural intermittent fasting built in even though they may not be calling it intermittent fasting um, and then they also are having more of an um, ancestral diet and I'll have to find the website I don't know if I can find it real quick while we're on here but there's actually if you google um, ancestral diets there's actually an organization that try that um, has rearranged the food pyramid. So it's not like our classic food pyramid where carbohydrates are at the base. Um, it's, they've looked at different cultures and put together different ancestral food pyramids. Um, and I, that site is really interesting because depending on your um, ethnic background, you know, you could find different cultural um, ancestral diets, which are recommended so that you know, you don't feel like you're just adopting a diet with food that isn't realistic. Do you know what I mean? Or that you're, that you're used to eating. Um, I don't know if I can pop, pull it up right now or not. I'm looking. Um, it was either like ancestral ways or ancestral diet. Um, it may be this site. Let me click on it. 
No, that's a personal blog. So I'll, I'll have to look at it and I'll uh, DM it to you. And then I'll also post it on um, my Insta story stickers. But there's, there's a good website that talks about ancestral diets and examples for each culture. Like it has a Mediterranean example. It has um, examples for Latin America versus Spain. It has um, examples for an African type diet. It's, it's really interesting. Okay. Well, what I'm just hearing you say, too, is that I'm thinking also that I probably um, could do it with less meat. Yeah. I was, I was looking at that, that portion of it as well. I like the idea that I'm now between the hours of 10 and 4, so that I'm not eating all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing, I have some periods. The fasting hours, it, it gives me a, a period where I'm just saying no rather than always saying no. Mm -hmm. So it gives me a place to start. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah. And then I think too, when you have your eating window, then you can focus on getting more nutrient dense foods, you know? So that's, that's yeah. the thing too. It makes meal planning and, and those sort of items easier. Um, we're thinking that, um, at this, this is a beginning for me, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm and I'm I'm being cognizant of not trying to overwhelm myself. Mm -hmm. And I found that just that the past week, since your last blogging, your uh, the last time you were on, mm -hmm. that's when I began eating within that t that that window. So uh, it's been about a week. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking now maybe I'll think about the meat because as you said, the rice and the and the black eyed cheese, it was it's, I, when you said that I thought about the other stuff that went around that meal. Right, right. And <laughs> and and that and that's the thing I find too, because it's just and I mean I've done it before too. It's I, I find that we'll fixate on one thing that we're eating. Um but if they're if but it's it's kind of the whole thing in in totality and it's yeah. definitely not about necessarily uh being perfect and and i mean black eyed peas sounds you know great so I'm not, it's plant-based yeah. you know i'm not gonna say don't eat uh black eyed peas and and as we pointed out there's many cultures around the world where rice is their staple and by and large they're not suffering from obesity so you know it's right. i think the the good carbs bad carbs probably oversimplifies it more because our bodies are very complex. Um, but it's, I think it's a good start when we're talking about things that come out of a package that have a long ingredients list that you don't recognize what half of the stuff is in it. Um, you know, that cutting stuff out like that is probably a good place to start or at least decreasing it. And then you can play around with the different proportions of your green leafy vegetables versus your pro your meat, um, you know, versus your starchy type carbs that you may be having. Yes. Mm -hmm. So no, I think those are, those are all good places. And then I know you also um, had a question um, about, about just keto in general or ketogenic and intermittent oh, fasting. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. So I tend to be more of a low carb person, but low carb. So I think first we were talking about ketogenic versus low carb. Um, low carb is really, depending on what source you read, can be anywhere from having 130 grams of carbs or less a day, some sources will say 60 grams of carbs or less a day. Um, ketogenic, everyone's level or set point on to what their carbs, uh, what type of carb intake will maintain ketosis per se is different. So for example, you'll see a lot of things that say in order to be in ketosis, you need to have less than 20 grams of carbs a day. It, but that it's so dependent on your activity level, if you're intermittent fasting, um, you know, your overall metabolic health, you can potentially be in ketosis at higher levels of carbs. So that's the first thing. And then number two is whether or not you want to be in ketosis or not. 
you know, um, a lot of people's goal is it's overall health. Um, now being in ketosis is definitely has, um, a benefit for certain medical conditions. They're starting to find out more about using a ketogenic diet in the treatment of epilepsy, um, a ketogenic diet. They're, tr they're starting to institute that into some, um, cancer research and cancer therapies also as it relates to recovery from chemotherapy. So there, there definitely are health benefits. Um, but whether or not one needs to be in ketosis 24-7, seven, seven days a week, 365 a year, I mean, that that's debatable. Um, so that's kind of a tangent. But when you think of the ketogenic diet, basically what's happening is rather than your body running on glucose, it's running on ketones. So your body has the ability to produce ketone bodies. And that's why there's not necessarily an essential carbohydrate. Now, carbohydrates have other antioxidants, other nutrients, plants, vegetables, etc. But you could technically survive not eating a single carb. That's because our body through a process called gluconeogenesis, gluco meaning glucose, neogenesis meaning to make or new, that our liver does that. And so our body can synthesize all of the glucose that we need to maintain bodily functions. When you're at a low level of glucose, you're at a low level of insulin. And then your body starts to preferentially burn fat. And so that's what keto is traditionally thought of. You're in a fat burning state. So you are um, fueling yourself off of ketone bodies. And, and you're, they cross the brain. I mean, so your brain can run off ketones. Uh, again, that's why we think it's helpful with the uh, people with resistant epilepsy because, uh, and I'm not as versed, I'm not a neurologist, but the ketone bodies help stabilize the seizure activities or the neurons in the brain, then making you less likely to have seizures. Um, so that's keto in a sense. And what a lot of people find just naturally when you are in ketosis, um, one, because if you're eating meals that have a higher fat or co uh, protein content, you're just more full, you're more satiated. And so you're able then to go longer periods between meals. So intermittent fasting just kind of falls naturally into someone who is ketogenic or in ketosis because some of those um, hormones that, you know, signal um, – at hunger, like ghrelin, that's a, a famous hormone, basically, that when ghrelin levels are high, it activates certain pathways that induce hunger. And so if you're suppressing some of those signals with the ketogenic diet, it just makes intermittent fasting easier to do. That's mm -hmm. what a lot of people find. So you'll notice people who are keto, um, they typically don't have a difficult time with intermittent fasting because they are are they're getting those signals that are decreasing their hunger cues. Um, now you don't have to fast to be keto and you don't have to, uh, be, uh, to be in ketosis. You don't have to fast if that makes sense. Um, but a lot of people just find that it goes together. Okay. I think I'll have to look some of this up. Yeah, in terms of <laughs> how the how the role in the different diets. But I mean, I think yeah. going back to your point, just eating an ancestral way. So certainly um, keto does work for a lot of people. Um, and like I said, I myself, I tend to be lower carb. So I am in ketosis a lot of the times. Um, but at the same time, you can also be extremely healthy and do intermittent fasting as a vegan, as a vegetarian, as a pescatarian, or as someone who still eats meat but has more of a plant-based diet. So it, it definitely isn't a requirement that you have to do or aim for ketosis, you know, and only have 20 grams of carbs a day in order for intermittent fasting to work. Okay. And I think, too, sometimes if people try to focus on doing too many things at once, you know, for instance, if, if 
for someone who may have had a, a pop habit so and a sugar habit. So I'm going to cut out all pop, all sugar. I'm going to fast for 18 hours a day. And then I'm only going to eat 20 grams of carbs I, all at once. I mean, that's probably not you know, doable. <laughs> I, I, I mean, for some people it is, but I also think you have to do baby it's steps. Suffer. It's suffer. And, and, and you, you have to figure out kind of what your biggest problem area is and then start there so if your goal is you know what I eat a lot at night because night eating um is a big thing where people eat um I mean there's even a night eating syndrome and so you don't want you, you know pick something that's realistic that you can start with so you know it's winter right now the sun is down well, now the days are getting longer, but it's probably dark by five um, or most places, at least by six, it's dark. So that could be something if you're used to eating lots of meals at eight or nine p.m. at night, you know, for a week. Why don't you see what happens if you stop eating by seven and then, um, you know, decrease that to six, get the hang of that for a couple weeks, then say, oh, OK. Now I know that I'm drinking a lot of pop or I see Fit MD says soda. I refuse to say soda. I'm from the North. It's pop. Um, but if you, you know, cut that out, um, you know, then, hashtag, then try to hashtag, decrease that. Hashtag dry water. Yeah. Hashtag hashtag dry water. Water. That, was my, that was my thing this week. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you pick something and then yep. see what happens because I just, I think that, um, you know, I, and I say this a lot, but a lot, a gradual, many small changes over time leads to big changes. And yeah. so I think that you pick one thing, whether that's you do it for a week or you do it for a couple weeks or a month and then add something else. And then over time, now you've either become more of a plant-based person just by making gradual changes or you've become a low carb person but again what we're trying to do is decrease our reliance on processed foods so that's that's i think the the big thing with that and so yeah it's it, i you know just find i think whatever way of eating you choose you just have to find something that is sustainable because anything works if you try it for a short time but you want to find something that you're going to be able to do for the rest of your life so, okay. So I um, think that uh, were, those were all of the questions that I had from you. Um, we are running a little long, not that I have, you know, some, a time limit necessarily on Instagram, but I don't know how long people keep um, watching after <laughs> After 30 minutes, let me, I'm scrolling through now to see if there were any other questions. Um, it's, uh, Nola D, so when you were talking about rice, um, she asked, what about cauliflower rice, if that would be a good substitute for regular rice? And I would say, yeah, definitely. Um, lots of people are using the cauliflower rice as a substitute um, for various meat. Uh, not meat, sorry, rice containing dishes. So you could definitely try it um, and see if that's something you'd like. So if you want to do black eyed peas with cauliflower rice, you could see how that works and if you like the taste of it. Um, I've made cauliflower fried rice before as a low carb substitute um, for regular rice and it's pretty, it's, it's really good. You can barely tell that you're not eating rice. So yeah, cauliflower rice is a good substitute. Um, and then someone asked, do you have to be fasting to be in ketosis? And the answer to that is no. If you restrict your carbohydrates and then have regular physical activity, depending on what your body weight is, you can induce ketosis without intermittent fasting. And there are lots of people who don't fast um, who are keto. It's just a lot of times it goes hand in hand. So I think those were all the questions that we received tonight. And then I will try to find that link to the ancestral diets that they map across cultures. Cause I, I do really think that is a big component is, you know, for instance, like I said, my aunt who uh, 
eats at 10 and four and is more plant-based diet. I mean, she's 102. She didn't, you know, make her plate and say, I'm going to do a plant-based diet, you know, 70 years ago when she was choosing how she wanted to eat. You know, she ate primarily what was around her, what they grew, um, and then added on from there. So I, I do think there's a lot of different um, approaches to health. But right now, the um, Mediterranean diet is getting a lot of traction and a lot of press. Um, and as you study that way of eating, um, that centers on plants as the focus um, with um, meat coming primarily in the form of fish and poultry. So, but yeah, I think that that's all I have for tonight. And I think what we'll do is hopefully in the next uh, couple weeks, I'm going to have a few physicians on, um, it may be towards the end of this month or starting in February, but uh, one physician in particular is going to have a discussion on exactly what it means to be plant-based because a lot of people are throwing that hashtag around, you know, they'll say plant-based, plant-based diet, plant-based way of life, plant-based, plant-based. But I, it, I think it would be interesting to have a discussion from a physician who is actually integrating a plant-based uh, way of eating into their practice to discuss what that means, how to get started, um, what that actually looks like, because I do think there's a lot of misconceptions about that. So hopefully that'll be coming up in a few weeks, along with discussions about BMI, um, body mass index, uh, or how obesity can affect orthopedic-related conditions, um, and just try to get more information out there about why we should even um, care about the things that we're eating, um, along with how to actually implement a change in a diet that might be sustainable using some success um, or diets that are backed by science and data. So I thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for the right. information. I'm so grateful for it. Oh, no problem. And I hope this continues to be an informational um, chat for everyone and to everyone out there listening and then to you as well, Francis. Um, you know, everyone have a great week. God bless and happy fasting. All righty. Thank you. So All right. Have a good night. Good night. Bye-bye.